Committee will come to order. Today's hearing is entitled, Transparency is an Alternative to the Federal Government's Regulation of Risk. I'm Patrick McKinnon. I'm the Chairman of the Subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Quigley from Illinois is the Ranking Member. Uh, sorry for the lateness of the start of this hearing. We've just had a uh, significant round of votes on the House floor. And so uh, as we begin all hearings in this subcommittee, I uh, feel it is appropriate to read the Oversight and Government Reform's mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I now recognize myself for three minutes for an opening statement. <clears throat> Today we examine the rule writing of Section 941 of the Dodd-Frank Act which mandates Federal regulators promulgate rules requiring entities to retain a certain amount of risk on securitized assets. We will compare the rules of risk retention and its special exemptions to policies and rules that would ensure adequate transparency and standardization under Section 942 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which requires the SEC to modify uh, Regulation AB to include loan-level disclosure. The focus of this comparison is to examine the effect that transparency and risk retention have on the market. Most importantly, how does, this, how does each influence the availability and cost of credit to borrowers and small businesses? As Federal agencies issue rules and announce uh, comment periods, risk retention has become hotly debated. I appreciate the intention of requiring a little skin in the game, as we will say, the theory being that it is an, uh, that it, if an issuer retains a piece of the ongoing responsibility for the loans that they write, they have an incentive to make better loans and price them appropriately. However, like all government rules and mandates, there are ex, uh, exemptions which provide, uh, provided for certain entities. To begin with, Dodd-Frank exempts FHA from risk retention requirements. It holds this coveted advantage in the marketplace due to the full backing of the U.S. taxpayer. However, Dodd-Frank does not impose the restrictions on FHA's underwriting standards, moving uh, the agency into a position of accepting lower qualified mortgages, more or less appearing to defeat the stated intention that this administration has said uh, to reduce taxpayer exposure to the housing market. In addition to exempting FHA, the QRM rulemaking uh, does not permit private mortgage insurance for Comp uh, to compensate for lower down payments. I have got concerns about this. This raises the concern that we are driving out prudently underwritten low down payment option mortgages, uh, particularly for first time home buyers, uh, which I think further exacerbates the imbalance between the private market and FHA lending. Secondly, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are exempted under the propo proposed risk retention rule, which runs contrary to the language laid out in the Dodd-Frank Act. And before anyone forgets Fannie and Freddie, uh, this exemption appears to go against the administration's proposal, uh, the broad proposal that they have to reform Fannie and Freddie and wind down the GSEs. Well, third, there is no secret that risk retention favors uh, large, well-capitalized banks uh, as compared to smaller, uh, less-capitalized banks. Uh, under the largest uh, under only the largest financial institutions have the balance sheet to retain uh, for extended periods the 5 percent of all securization they complete. This leaves one to ask the question, how will risk retention rules affect the operations and competitiveness of our community and small banks? and small businesses that access their loans through those institutions. In addition, today's hearing gives us an opportunity to gauge the value of risk retention and loan level disclosures and how government can push forward policies to open up our capital markets without opening the floodgates of unintended consequences. One thing is for certain, our families and businesses cannot afford overreaching government policies that increase the cost of credit and stifle economic growth. 
It is imperative that our rules and regulations enable the market to appropriately price the cost of capital to our families and small businesses while recognizing the importance of private capital in the housing sector. I look forward to our uh, panel's testimony. And with that, I recognize uh, Mr. Quigley for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our priority in the final analysis must be to ensure that the reforms are implemented that would prevent a repeat of the 2008 financial crisis. That crisis sparked the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. There can be no financial crisis amnesia when it comes to implementing Dodd-Frank. One of the chief causes of the meltdown was the originate to distribute model of mortgage lending. Through this model, securitization was used as a means for financial institutions to escape all of the risk associated with the mortgage loans they underwrote. On October 23, 2008, former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan explained in testimony before this committee, quote, too many securitizers and lenders believe they were able to create and sell mortgage-backed securities so quickly that they never put their shareholders' capital at risk, and hence did not have the incentive to evaluate the credit quality of what they were selling. These practices led to riskier loans and misaligned incentives between lenders, securitizers, and investors in mortgage-backed securities. This originate to distribute model has ultimately been cited as a key driver of the current foreclosure epidemic. That is why a vital piece of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act is its provision on risk retention, Section 941. By requiring securitizers to have, quote, skin in the game, we make lenders and investment banks more accountable for the loans they have made and facilitated. The title of this hearing suggests that we should view transparency as an alternative to risk retention. I think there is a likely wide consensus on both sides of the aisle that increased transparency is a laudable goal. However, I would emphasize that increased transparency must not come at the expense of accountability. The proposed risk retention rule which so many agencies work to generate, puts a measure of accountability into effect. As the Dodd-Frank Act's risk retention provisions are implemented, we must ensure that creditworthy families are able to access affordable loans. We must also ensure that the Nation's 5,000-plus community banks are not disadvantaged in their, in their ability to serve their customers. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses on these issues and thank them for being here today. I thank the ranking member for uh, his opening statement. And with that, we're going to uh, let me introduce the panel, and then we'll swear you in. Uh, we have Mr. Edward DeMarco, the acting director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. We have Dr. Anthony Sanders, uh, professor of finance in the School of Management at George Mason University. Uh, we have Mr. Joshua Rosner, a partner uh, at Graham Fisher and Company. And we have Ms. Yannicka uh, 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 Radcliffe uh, is the Executive Director of the Center for Community Capital at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I am a native of North Carolina, and so my apologies especially for my mispronunciation of your name. Uh, with that, uh, it is the standard procedure of this committee uh, to swear in all the witnesses. So if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, let the record show that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, we will, uh, uh, as most of you are familiar, we have this lighting system here in Congress, uh, green, red, and yellow. Look, we are members of Congress. We need very basic things. Um, and so I will recognize you for five minutes. Uh, and with uh, uh, 30 seconds remaining, you will get the yellow light, which means simply wrap up, and at red, it means, well, it means stop. So with that, Mr. DeMarco, you are recognized for five minutes to give an opening statement. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman McHenry, um, Ranking Member Quigley, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. The Federal Housing Finance Agency believes that enhancing the quality and quantity of data available to investors in mortgage-backed securities is an important step to encourage the return of private capital to the mortgage market. To do so, we need to ensure that those owners with capital have the data needed to estimate and price mortgage credit and prepayment risk. 
Such transparency is a critical component of a healthy and efficient secondary mortgage market, whether or not issuers retain financial liability for some portion of the credit risk of the assets they securitize. Risk retention, meanwhile, is a complementary measure designed to give securitizers an economic stake in the credit performance of the loans, just like investors. Risk retention seeks to protect investors and reduce information asymmetries by requiring that issuers of asset-backed securities have a financial stake in the performance of loans underlying a security, or, as it has been said, skin in the game. Through risk retention, securitizers will have a disincentive to acquire poor quality loans for securitization because they will be required to actually hold a portion of the credit risk rather than passing it all on to investors. This exposure to credit risk should, in turn, make securitizers more careful with the quality of loan originations. As a result of these improved incentive alignments, investors are expected to be more willing to provide capital for residential mortgages and other types of loans. This may be an important step in facilitating the return of private capital to the residential housing market and other lending markets that benefit from securitization. Regulators published the proposed rule to implement the risk retention requirements of the Dodd-Frank Act in March. In developing that proposal, the agency sought to implement the provision as legislated, allowing for a range of securitization structures. The public comment period on the rule extends until June 10, and the agencies invited comments on more than 100 different questions. The MBS disclosures of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have expanded over the years to offer more detailed information to investors. Both enterprises provide aggregate pool-level information that in many respects aligns with the Securities and Exchange Commission's Regulation AB requirements. In addition, Freddie Mac provides some amount of loan-level information and both enterprises in the past year have enhanced their disclosures on mortgage delinquencies. Enhancing loan level disclosures on enterprise MBS, both at the time of origination and throughout a security's life, is on our agenda. I believe that improving enterprise MBS disclosures over time will help establish consistency and quality of such data. Moreover, it will contribute to an environment in which private capital has the information needed to efficiently measure and price mortgage credit risk, thereby facilitating the shifting of this risk away from the government and back into the private sector. This will take time to accomplish, but this is the direction in which we at FHFA are heading. In sum, FHFA views risk retention and enhancing disclosure of the mortgages backing MBS as complementary reforms. We also see value in moving the enterprises over time toward the loan level disclosures that the amendments to Regulation AB proposed by the SEC would require. Enhancements of enterprise MBS disclosures have continued to occur since they were placed in conservatorship in 2008, and FHFA will continue down that path. We will also work closely with the other agencies to review the public comments on the interagency risk retention rulemaking before releasing a final rule that is consistent with the statutory framework. I believe that we are making progress on many fronts as Congress is beginning to take up housing finance reform. Thank you for this opportunity, and I would be pleased to answer questions. Thank you. Dr. Sanders. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Dodd-Frank requires that securitizers retain at least 5 percent of the risk in all loans that do not qualify as a qualified residential mortgage and are sold in the securitization market. In theory, 5 percent risk retention would lead securitizers to be more careful in the loan origination and underwriting process. To be sure, 5 percent retention would be the simplest approach to implement to encourage improved loan origination and underwriting. But unfortunately, risk retention appears to be the least useful approach. There are four points that I would like to make. First, the house price collapse that resulted in house price declines that far exceeded 5 percent. For example, Las Vegas fell 56 percent from peak to trough, 5 percent would have been blown through very quickly. Second, risk retention does not directly address origination risk. Representations and warrants that are found in mortgage loan purchase agreements and related documents directly address origination risk. The avalanche of loan repurchase requests in the aftermath of the housing collapse makes reps and warranties less viable for non-agency-backed securities. Third, the FHA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac are exempt from the risk retention rules 
Exempting these players in the mortgage market defeats the spirit of the risk retention, since the loan originator will be tempted to sell or be insured by Fannie, Freddie, and the FHA rather than keep the retained risk. Fourth, given Reg AB, Dodd-Frank 942, and the anticipated transparency of the ABS markets, the retention rule implies that qualified institutional investors are not sophisticated enough to understand origination risks and need to be protected beyond greater transparency. Fannie, Freddie, and others do not require additional security of 5 percent risk retention since they perform substantial due diligence and analysis before purchasing securities. And also, securitizers can hedge the risks of risk retention, and typically in industry experience, they oftentimes keep the first piece 5 percent of risk retention anyway. In summary, it is unclear how risk retention will be implemented, vertical versus horizontal versus L cuts. And if effective, and if, even if it is effective in reducing origination risk. There are more effective alternatives to risk retention, transparency, and improved representations and warranties. One solution to origination risk is to provide greater transparency to investors. Transparency would permit more accurate pricing. Greater transparency potentially reduces the asymmetric information between securitizers and investors. There has already been a movement in the industry towards this. Prospectus and prospectus supplements from both agency and non-agency MBS provide detailed breakdowns of underlying loans in terms of critical risk measures such as loan-to-value ratio, loan type, and credit score. Freddie Mac has taken loan transparency to a new level in 2006 by providing a file of loan-level information. The non-agency market, as well as the FHA, could provide similar loan-level disclosure. I would prefer that securitizers provide transparency themselves rather than be forced through regulation, however. Some investors may prefer having less information disclosed, which would result in higher expected yield compared to fully disclosed loan information. Investors should retain the right to choose how much information and what they want disclosed by securitizers. But additional loan disclosures is one prong of the approach to uh, improving loan quality. The, second, the other is an enacted securitization certificate approach to reducing securitization risk. Even though securitization, securitizers could release great loan level information, the market would still be concerned that the information is inaccurate. There should be mechanisms to ensure that the disclosed information is actually correct. The securitization or origination certificate approach has the potential to be effective because it, direct, it directly addresses origination risk and contains a fraud penalty. The certificate would travel with a loan and would verify that the loan was originated in accordance with the law and that the underwriting data was accurate, and then the loan made all the required underwriting and uh, requirements. The certificate would be backed by a guarantee from the originating firm and uh, demonstrate that they had financial viability. The seller must provide means of demonstrating financial responsibility via either capital or insurance for the loans to be put into securitization. There should be a penalty for violations of representation warranties beyond repurchase obligations and tracking of violations of representations and warranties available to all investors. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Mr. Rosner. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify on this important issue. Current problems in the economy stemming from opacity and information asymmetry in the asset-backed market are not addressed by the Dodd-Frank risk retention rule. While the rule is well-intentioned, it is also misguided. Dodd-Frank reasons that if lenders and issuers retain some financial liability for the underlying loans they sell, they will have a greater incentive to make better loans and securities. On the surface, this appears to make sense. If a lender or securitizer knows he will have to drink some of the poison he offers to others, then he would think twice about creating the potion. But as we saw in the past crisis, the banks in direst need for direct government support found themselves in that predicament precisely because they had swallowed large portions of the poison they had sold to others. Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch didn't even have operational controls, available information, or an ability to fully model their exposures. As we have seen, even with a 5 percent risk retention of each structure, different structures of similar underlying collateral remain highly correlated. Thus, if securitization returns and grows, risk retention will create a future systemic risk of already too big to fail firms transferring those risks to the taxpayer. 
A better solution is to create industry standards of useful and timely disclosures of loan-level collateral information so parties to securitization could analyze the assets underlying pools. Even after the disaster, an information asymmetry between buyer and seller remains the standard. I advocate reconsideration of the risk retention rule, but doing so without first addressing the dangerous opacity that remain in the market would only increase risks. This is especially so given that legislators have already reduced information available to investors through elimination of the Reg FD exemption for rating agencies. Currently, with no pre-issuance roadshow period during which investors have the ability to analyze a deal and its underlying collateral, the primary market for securitizations is different from the equity markets. Deals usually came to market before a collateral pool was even complete, forcing investors to rely on rating agencies pre-issuance circulars. These tools have proven laughably inadequate. Instead, data on specific underlying collateral in each pool should be made available for a reasonable period before a deal is sold and brought to market. Such a requirement would enhance investor due diligence, foster the development of independent analytical data providers, and reduce reliance on rating agencies. Capital and markets would be less volatile if investors could fully model the expected performance of underlying loan, collateral, loan level collateral and regularly reassess their deviance from expectations. Uniformity of contract is also required. PSAs and reps and warrants define features like rights to put back loans with underwriting flaws, responsibility of servicers and trustees, and the relationship between different tranches. They can be several hundred pages long. Key terms defining contractual obligations can differ significantly, and they are not standardized across the industry, across securities with the same type of collateral, or even by issuer. It was not until the crisis that investors considered this lack of standardization. Thus, when panic set in and investors began to question the value of their securities, they knew that they didn't have time to read all the different several hundred page deal agreements reinforcing the run on the market which caused securities values to fall further than fundamentals justified. Legislation should create both servicing standards and a single standardized PSA governing each collateral asset class with investor and public interest at core. Standards must also focus on addressing a lack of clear definitions in securitization markets. Without a common language, the value of data is diminished. Conversely, if everyone is using the same common language, then it becomes very hard to game the system. Amazingly, three years after the crisis, there is still no single standard accounting or legal definition of either delinquency or default. Currently, delinquency can be determined either on a contractual or recency of payment basis. Even among firms that would define it identically, each servicing agreement can have different interpretations of delinquency reporting. Some may report advances that a servicer makes to a pool which could be applied to reduce stated delinquencies. Other servicers may not. The Wild West mentality in securitization needs to be replaced with transparency and an agreement on terms and standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosner. Ms. Ratcliffe. Good afternoon, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee. As mentioned, I am with the UNC Center for Community Capital. I also serve on the Mortgage Finance Working Group, convened by the Center for American Progress to offer a plan for responsible housing market reform. Please note that the views expressed are my own, and they focus on the mortgage market aspects of the questions raised today. I am honored to be asked to discuss how transparency and accountability can help restore confidence in the once robust U.S. mortgage system. Confidence in that system was shattered among investors and borrowers at both ends of the system, and the taxpayers who find themselves propping it up. Only the full faith and credit of the government has kept the market open, and ultimately private capital must bear a greater share of the load. The crisis was a result of abuses that arose in a regulatory vacuum and a climate of inadequate transparency, lack of accountability, and misaligned interests. The Dodd-Frank Act identifies key steps toward a market that is safer for investors, taxpayers, and for borrowers. One of these is transparency. Lack of transparency in the private label market enabled adverse selection and underpricing of risk because issuers knew more than investors. Certainly better loan level information and product standardization will help usher back in the private market. But even with good loan level data, private market investors will face potential principal agent problems and conflicts of interest nor will this help borrowers, many of whom took on loans when the true costs and consequences were masked by complexity. 
The system cannot function well unless borrowers' interests in repaying their loans and investors' interests in being repaid are served by the agents in between them. So risk retention can help address these principal agent problems by aligning incentives and holding issuers more accountable, as Dodd-Frank intends. While the regulatory proposal largely mirrors this intent, we are concerned that a too narrow QRM box may discourage private capital participation and possibly disrupt the fragile market. For example, the down payment criteria may put a procyclical damper on the fragile housing recovery, particularly if mortgage insurance is not taken into account. That would be a pity, as we have ample experience about the right way to finance lower down payment mortgages. At UNC, we study a large pool of mortgages made in the decade preceding the crisis under affordable housing and CRA programs. The borrowers had access to prime, fixed-rate, long-term amortizing mortgages that they could afford to repay. These households have experienced low default rates and, on average, meaningful equity buildup. We found that non-prime loans made to similar borrowers were several times more likely to have defaulted than those in our study. Key factors associated with these higher defaults were adjustable rate, broker channel, and prepayment penalty. These findings underscore that risk retention should apply to product and process factors that increase risk, not to characteristics of borrowers. That said, overall, the risk retention provisions will certainly improve accountability and, with greater transparency, should put um, more natural market-imposed limits on the total amount of risk taken on by the system. But even transparency, standardization, and risk retention are not in and of themselves enough to return the market to long-term vibrancy uh, and resilience and attract the amount of private capital needed. These are just two of the tools needed to rebuild the market. The system must also provide for broad and constant liquidity for a nearly $11 trillion market, mechanisms that limit volatility, access to affordable and sustainable financing for home ownership and rental housing, including for underserved segments, and preservation of the long-term fixed-rate mortgage, which provides economic stability at the household and macroeconomic levels. All this can be achieved with private capital serving the lion's share, with the provision of a limited Federal backstop that is highly protected by adequate private capital in the first loss position, and that is explicit and that is paid for. Such a mechanism will provide investors the confidence to deliver a, lot, a reliable supply of capital for both rental and home ownership options every day and in every community over economic cycles through large and small lenders alike. In summary, restoring confidence in the mortgage market will require greater transparency and greater accountability that we recommend a broader QRM definition than regulators have proposed. However, the ultimate impact of these measures is highly dependent on the form that the mortgage secondary market takes. As you move forward in this complex process, it is important to bring private capital back, it is important to protect the taxpayers, but it is also important to restore the financial system so that it works better for the American households who rely on it for economic security. Transparency and confidence throughout the system depends on having informed borrowers who have access to sound, well-underwritten loans. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate the whole panel's, uh, whole panel's testimony. With that, I am going to recognize the Vice Chair, Mr. Gent of New Hampshire, for five minutes for the first round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming and testifying this afternoon. Uh, the first question I have, I would like to throw it out to the panel. Um, my question is simply this. Who is purchasing uh, these mortgage-backed securities and what level of sophistication um, do these buyers have? And then secondly, are these the types of buyers that need uh, insurances uh, through risk retention, or is, is it in your opinion that because of their qualification they don't need um, assurances? I can start with Mr. Rosner. The, the buyers are qualified institutional buyers. They are sophisticated investors. Uh, the very nature of the structure of selling uh, MBS is that you have to sell the equity in MES tranche before you can sell the investment grade rated tranches. Um, so typically, the buyer who is the, the key buyer is the one who is going to do the most due diligence if the information is available. Uh, given the ability to look at loan level data before a deal comes to market, they will therefore be the determinant of price by determining what they perceive as value. Uh, I don't think they need assurances as much as they need clarity of contract and as much as they need the loan level data, probably in preformatted, industry standardized uh, uh, format, to do that analysis for a period before a deal comes to market. Dr. Sanders? 
Uh, thank you. I agree with what Josh is saying. I, and I would say that uh, PIMCO, WAMCO, Fannie, Freddie, and most of these investors we are talking about, the QIBs, are extremely sophisticated investors. They do their homework, due diligence. Uh, I agree with Josh that uh, it would be nice if they could get information on loan level details ahead of time. In fact, I am surprised they haven't been requesting that over time. But if you look at, again, as I said, pro-sups and prospective supplements uh, issued by various, they do go into fairly detailed loan level analysis, but it is not as much as like Freddie gave out you know, on their loan levels, which is what I would like to say going forward. Ms. Radcliffe, would you agree that they need clarity of contract rather than uh, the assurances? I think that I think that they are both important. Uh, there, there was not as much loan level data information, and clearly having that available to the investors should help their ability to assess the risk. There is no question of that. I still think that doesn't take care of all the principal agent problems that might arise. There could still, of course, be misrepresentation. There could still be adverse selection. And, and even with full data, a lot of the complicated models were used. People were not, necessi not necessarily coming up with the right answer. So I think there is a lot of different risks inherent in the system, and each of these solutions we propose addresses a different set of issues. So I am not sure it is an either-or. I think it is a both-and. Okay. Mr. DeMarco? Um, I would only add to what the uh, other panelists have said, is that uh, when we think about the holders or investors in mortgage-backed securities, uh, probably important when you want to know who they are and how they are responding to these things, uh, to distinguish between those that are investing in private label mortgage-backed securities for which the credit risk is managed through the securitization structure and each of the investors, no matter where they are in that structure, uh, understand they are undertaking credit risk. And those that are investing in Ginnie Mae uh, mortgage-backed securities or now with Fannie and Freddie uh, in conservatorship and operating uh, with the backstop of the Treasury Department. Uh, the sense of government support, the credit analysis and the credit review of the investors and also what they are looking for in a security is clearly going to be different for some of those investors relative to investors in private label mortgage-backed securities. Ms. Radcliffe, I want to go back to something that you mentioned. Um, you, you said that that only really essentially solves part of the problem relative to misrepresentations. Aren't, don't we have other laws, though, on the books now that uh, are sufficient relative to misrepresentation? It's, I think it is a matter of the, the processes and tools that are available, the remedies that are available to the investors. I think we had some proposals made here that would, again, address some of those a little better, I think. Um, I, I guess while I have the mic, I might also add that uh, the investors who are making these investments today in the private market, not in the, the Fannie Freddie securities, um, they are a very small universe of investors right now who are undertaking actually extensive and lengthy due diligence. And so um, if what, what you are talking about instead is a situation where private investors could return in, in large scale, it would probably be a very different scenario. And then I only have a few seconds left, but to Mr. Rosner, can you just talk very quickly about the unintended consequences that you see in risk retention? Well, again, uh, the, the assumption in the risk retention rule is that the, the banks acted, the issuers acted uh, maliciously in all circumstances, and that forcing them to retain risk would solve for that. Quite often what we found was that they assumed, uh, made assumptions based on models which proved to be deeply flawed and historic assumptions that proved to be inaccurate and retained risks themselves forcing them to retain risks and creating a system where everyone is mismodeling the same problem, the same collateral at the same time, will risk creating a situation where the correlation ends up demonstrating again to, a, to cause a systemic crisis as it did. And that would be better to have those risks dispersed in the hands of investors rather than concentrated back in our depository institutions or, or, bank, or, or investment banks. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thank you. At a, a request of the subcommittee ranking member, I will first yield on their side of the aisle to the full committee ranking yes. member, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I want to thank you all for calling this hearing. And as I listened to you, Mr. Rosner, I could not help but think about all the people who are out of their houses, the ones in my district who lost big time, uh, the ones who come to foreclosure conferences that I have held six of them the last two years crying. And it is very unfortunate how short our memories can sometimes be. 
It appears that some members of the committee do not recall that one of the frequently cited statements articulating the causes of the financial crisis was made in this very hearing room at the very table that you all are sitting at. On October 23, 2008, at the height of the financial crisis, the full Committee on Oversight and Government Reform held a hearing entitled The Financial Crisis and the Role of Federal Regulators, at which former Federal Reserve Chairman Dr. Alan Greenspan testified, and I quote, what went wrong with global economic policies that had worked so effectively for nearly four decades? Too many securitizers and lenders believed they were able to create and sell mortgage-backed securities so quickly that they never put their shareholders' capital at risk and hence did not have the incentive to evaluate the credit quality of what they were selling, end of quote. Acting Director DeMarco, isn't one of the fundamental lessons of the financial crisis that catastrophic danger can be created when lenders are allowed to avoid all risks and, in essence, all accountability for their actions? I think that that is um, certainly a concern here, uh, Mr. Cummings. Um, the only thing I would moderate in that is that actually whether we, we did not have the form of risk retention that Dodd-Frank has, yet many of these, virtually all of these issuers, securitizers and loan originators of these awful mortgages were retaining risk in some fashion because they have virtually all gone out of business. The managers and owners of the firm have lost their capital. There were risk retention in other forms through things like representations and warranties. They didn't work as well as they should have, as some of the panelists have pointed out. But your point is basically well taken, sir. Let me ask you this. Yes. While we can debate additional policy proposals that would provide further safeguards within the securitization process, are we at risk of repeating the conduct which led us to the 2008 financial crisis unless there is some form of risk retention? I understand you are saying there, there was already some. Yes, sir. I, I think that risk retention in some form may be a, a, an, an important part of a better operating system going forward. But I think the other things that are being raised at this hearing, including improved transparency and disclosure to investors, is also absolutely critical to avoiding the kinds of problems we have had. So in other words, both Mr. Working. Ms. Radcliffe, is, is, there is nothing wrong with having both, is that right? No. Having, having the transparency and the risk re retention, because when I think about what our country has gone through, almost brought to, to our knees based upon what has happened here, it seems like we would err on the side of, of, of protecting and protection and being very careful as opposed to uh, just having one or the other. Transparency, I just don't think is enough. Ms. Radcliffe. I would agree. Again, there is a whole host of problems to be solved. Transparency will solve some of them. Uh, and again, as I made in, in, mentioned in my comments, transparency for, transparency for investors is not the same thing as transparency for borrowers, which also needs to be seen to. Risk retention is part of the solution. Standardization fits within that as well, because if you have well understood product parameters uh, and structures, both for borrowers and investors, that also enhances their ability to use the data they have to accurately assess risk and compare risks and price loans and comparison shops. Well, let me ask you this. So, so we do indeed have some agreement that a policy of risk retention, something that we achieved last Congress with the enactment of Dodd-Frank, is a, a necessary safeguard against the market practices which led to the financial crisis. And I know some of you all may disagree. I see you shaking your head, Mr. Rosner. Uh, Ms. Radcliffe, the Wall Street Journal commissioned a study which found that 61 percent of subprime loans originated in 2006 went to people with scores high enough to qualify for a prime loan with far better terms. Isn't it true that the originate to distribute model ended up pushing countless consumers into more expensive and thus riskier mortgages than the consumers were eligible for based on their credit scores and other characteristics? It, it would appear so. And I would add that the in my comments I mentioned the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which is a good example of transparency and standardization. Um, this is a product which in and of itself makes for a safer loan. Over time, the borrower's debt-to-income improves. 
as the loan pays down, the borrower's loan to value improves, and so it inherently enables a greater number of households to sustain home ownership safely. It also enables a potential homeowner, a, a potential mortgagor, to be able to compare one loan to another in the Sunday paper or online very easily because there is really only one factor, and so it is much easier to know if you are getting a good deal or not. Once borrowers were um, led into a marketplace that was, had much more complex products and, and features and options to consider, like the starter rate and the teaser rate and the maximum lifetime payment and so on and so forth, uh, it made it much more difficult for them to make good product selections. And that introduced a level of systemic risk, with, especially with the adjustable rate mortgage features. When rates changed and borrowers could no longer afford to make their products, that is a level of systemic risk that uh, you know, better product standardization and transparency could have alleviated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. And um, my question will recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Sanders, uh, Mr. Rosner, uh, this question is directed to you. So, uh, in my opening statement, I referenced the fact that Fannie and Freddie are exempt from this 5 percent risk retention. Um, we are currently, you know, we just it, uh, recently wrote a check, or the Treasury, the American taxpayer, uh, is, is uh, in just in the last, uh, last week for over $8 billion for Fannie and Freddie. This was after um, we we're, were in for many, many multiples of that currently. But what problems do you foresee with Fannie and Freddie being exempt from, from this risk retention rule? How do, you for, how do you foresee that playing out? Yeah, uh, at a time where we hear Treasury and the administration talk about reducing the role of uh, FHA, uh, Fannie and Freddie, and uh, trying to revive private markets to exempt Fannie and Freddie from the risk retention rule will actually only support and enhance their dominance in the market and will create an arbitrage where private lenders will have a, uh, a, an enhanced uh, or, or a necessary um, situation where they end up having to sell to the enterprises. Why? because the enterprises actually are considered already to fully retain the risk. Therefore, they don't have to play in the risk retention game. No, no. I mean, but why would private entities not be able to compete with that? Oh, because private entities would end up having an unfair economic disadvantage of having to compete by holding a 5 percent position against the enterprises who don't. Okay. Thank, thank you. Dr. I would uh, clarify that. I, I agree with what Josh is saying. But it is uh, it's, it's the old crowding out theme again. Once you exempt Fannie, Freddie, and the FHA from risk retention rules, the originators or securitizers, if they are forced to hold this and they have to make a decision between holding 5 percent or getting rid of it and giving it to Fannie, Freddie, and the FHA, we have made it a very clear path and an easy path just to keep Freddie, Fannie, and the FHA at 95 percent market share. And I think that goes against what the administration has said. Uh, they wanted to do. And I think this is, I almost, oh, almost call this the uh, uh, Fannie Freddie Enabling Act as opposed to Dodd Frank. Mr. Marco, do you agree with these sentiments? Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as one of the regulators as the responsible, of as, the regu Freddie. as the overseer and one of the regulators responsible for implementing this, uh, putting out this proposed rule, if I could just clarify a couple of things. And I am sorry this strikes folks as, as technical, but it is the way we view it. Fannie and Freddie are not exempt from risk retention. The proposed rule stipulates that because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac actually retain 100 percent of the credit risk in the mortgages that Actually, to correct you there, the American taxpayer has 100 percent of the credit risk. Yes, sir. And I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am incredibly mindful of that. Yes. Um, and we are working very hard to protect the American taxpayers' yeah, you investment in, in, in these companies. But the, but the rule, the, what the statute requires is for the securitizers, the issuer of an asset-backed security, to retain a portion of the credit risk. And the regulators have simply acknowledged in the proposed rule that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, when they issue a, a mortgage-backed security, they are retaining 100 percent of the credit risk. To the extent that one wants to see their portfolio begin to shrink and, and reduce reduce their footprint, forcing them to buy back or hold 5 percent of the securities that they issue is actually going to inflate their balance sheet. And while I am very supportive of the notion that we need to move the U.S. mortgage market away from one that is so much reliant upon government-related entities, I am not sure risk retention is the most effective or practical means for starting to move the government out and restore private sector participation. What is? 
Um, I think that uh, having the Congress of the United States take up uh, a comprehensive housing finance reform where we can figure out what the ultimate resolution of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to be is part of it. But the other thing is to, to really get private capital to uh, come in, come back into the U.S. mortgage market and be willing to um, evaluate price and undertake mortgage credit risk. Those investors, that private capital was going to want to know what are the rules of the road and what is the long-term role of the U.S. government in the housing market. And they're going to want, those investors are going to want clarity about where the government is limiting its involvement and just what is being really put back as available for the private sector so that it's not competing with entities that are operating with uh, direct support uh, and involvement from the U.S. government. Uh, Mr. Rosner, uh, back to you. In terms of the QRM. Um, currently, uh, private mortgage insurance uh, is, is not a part of the, this solution or this uh, definition uh, for under QRM. Uh, can you discuss, it, would that have a negative impact, do you think? Look, the, the private mortgage insurance industry has demonstrated that it offered no economic value in risk transfer. Uh, they were they were used largely by uh, because of a, a, the ninety two act which required the uh, the eighty plus LTV to get credit enhanced uh, on the enterprises in the private market they haven't really been used they have been not demonstrated to have been effective in underwriting their rescission rates on claims have been extraordinarily high and uh, most of them are operating under waivers with their state insurance regulators. Uh, so the notion that uh, private mortgage insurance has really helped the situation in any way I think is fallacious, and I don't think there is any evidence of that as witnessed by, uh, by the economic performance of their uh, insured loans relative to uh, a broader pool of loans. My time has expired, but Ms. Radcliffe, it looks like you, you are you're interested in answering that question. Well, I would mention that the uh, MI companies through the end of 2010 paid $22 billion in claims to the GSEs, which is 14 percent of the taxpayer uh, payments up to that point in time. So there is some economic benefit um, in that capital source to the market. Ms. Uh, that was with a, with a rescission rate that was uh, across the industry north of 20 percent at this point, uh, it seems. And uh, you are forgetting that they collected premiums. So really it was a return of, not a return on, uh, that insured premium. Thank you. Uh, I recognize Mr. Quigley for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director DeMarco, uh, less than a month ago, the Financial Services Committee held a subcommittee hearing entitled Understanding the Implications and Consequences of the Proposed Rule on Risk Retention at which your agency's chief economist, Patrick Lawler, testified, quote, one of the widely recognized causes of the financial crisis of 2008 was the poor quality of loans collateralizing many asset-backed securities, with subprime loan mortgages being the most flagrant culprits. Too often, lenders made loans they would not have been willing to hold themselves only because they knew they could sell them to securitizers at an attractive price. Is your thoughts and testimony consistent in that, in your mind, with that statement? I am not sure where that statement is attributed to, but yes, sir. I mean, this is written testimony. Sorry. It was in Mr. Lawler's testimony? Yes. Um, yes, and I think that that is consistent with what, uh, what I have had in my testimony, sir, about um, the uh, part of the problem that led to the, both the housing crisis and the economic crisis was uh, the bad underwriting that led to loans being securitized and uh, certainly a securitization model in the private label market that was uh, uh, pushing these loans uh, through to investors and um, uh, really a reliance upon the notion that house prices were going up rather than really doing due diligence and good credit review of the loans to ensure that the borrowers had the capacity to repay and had a credit history to suggest that they would. Does that strike you back to the question you were answering earlier, that transparency is an important asset in all of this, but uh, it is not mutually exclusive with proper securitization? Wouldn't the two yeah. go hand in hand? Yes, sir. What I would like to say about transparency is if, if, if the public policy objective is to see private risk capital 
reenter our mortgage-backed security market in a meaningful way so that mortgage credit risk is backed by private capital, not by the government, for that to succeed, one of the necessary steps is for those investors to have access to a much more robust set of data, both at the time of origination of the security and throughout the life of the security, so that those investors can properly evaluate and price the mortgage credit risk and prepayment risk of those mortgages. So we clearly have a lot of work to do to enhance the, the disclosure regime, the transparency for our private label mortgage-backed securities to really be able to function in a robust way in this market. The risk retention that has uh, been uh, proposed and is, was implemented in Dodd-Frank and that the regulators are in the midst of trying to um, implement now, um, what that is designed to do in some ways is to say, look, part of this problem that we have had is really bad underwriting. We have been doing bad loans and we want to get more accountability before that loan, loan hits an investor in the form of a mortgage-backed security. We want some, someone else in that pipeline to have greater responsibility for the quality of that loan and the quality of the underwriting. So what Congress settled on in Dodd-Frank is a risk retention requirement that puts that onus principally on the securitizer. What Dodd-Frank says is the risk retention should be that the securitizer retains a portion of the credit risk because they are in the best position to be able to oversee and have some um, uh, stake in whether the loan is originated is a good quality loan or not. And so that is how this is seen as an investor protection really designed to make sure through this form of the securitizer that the securitizer is paying attention to the quality of the loans. To Mr. Cummings' point earlier and to yours, that, you know, that there were loans that were being made here for which uh, the people at the front end of the process appeared not to um, be doing anything in terms of proper diligence in making the loan. Thank you. Dr. Sanders, I am not sure if, if you got a chance to uh, weigh in on the question that was asked whether these are not mutually exclusive issues. Uh, no, I have not been able to weigh in on that other than my testimony, but the, uh, I think greater transparency is, is a great thing and it will help drive better pricing. It will, and I agree with Mr. DeMarco, it will attract better capital. Uh, my, my concern uh, at the beginning was that uh, I'm concerned that risk retention sounds great, but it sends a false, comforting signal to the market because, as I said, housing prices, if they fall again, is going to wipe out risk retention in the snap of a finger. And, and secondly, the other issue is, is that the securitizers themselves can hedge risk retention. I mean, I know from my experience, when we would be holding the first loss pieces, we could go out and use either interest rate swaps or credit derivatives and, and just hedge out the uh, risk retention. So from our vantage point, that you know, made it neutral. But the point I want to make is, is I don't like the false signal that everyone suddenly thinks because we have risk retention, the days of bad underwriting, and we don't need transparency. I am just worried about that being the case. But again, transparency is good, and, and beefing up the reps and warranties in case of violations is really an important step to go forward. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. And with that, uh, we yield to uh, Ms. Speer of California. She is not here. So Ms. Maloney of New York is recognized for five minutes. Well, risk retention is basically having skin in the game. Is that correct? Wouldn't you say? They are holding on to a piece of it. And that is the way loans used to be made in banks. And we didn't have a problem when that was done. Uh, so I really don't understand, uh, Mr. Rosner, in, in your testimony, uh, you, you, have, uh, you expressed in your written testimony skepticism regarding the risk retention requirement in Dodd-Frank and uh, whether the pr proposed rule will ensure better lending, better underwriting, or safer markets. Um, and, uh, and in it, you said, on the surface, this appears to make sense if a lender or securitizer knows he will have to drink the poison in the chalice he uh, offers to others, then he would be more careful. That is one of your quotes. So uh, am I quoting you correctly, Mr. Rosner, and, and correctly with regard to the reasoning behind the proposed rule? Um, you are quoting me correctly, but you are quoting the first part of the quote. And mm -hmm. if you continue on, what it says is it, it, the lender would have a, on the surface, 
increased interest in making sure the loan was appropriate. But as we saw in the case of Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch, they died because of risk retention. And they didn't offload the risk, which would have been sensible if they really understood that they were creating poison. Instead, they retained it. And so in a world where people are mismodeling or misconsidering, or under-considering, or don't even have the information to understand what risks they retain, as Stan O'Neill highlighted in his testimony to the FCIC, he didn't even realize that his firm retained the risk that it did. You're causing these firms to concentrating risk and several firms, therefore, to have highly correlated risks to each other, when if you had lenders having the loans they made scrutinized by investors, the investors would price those risks at such a level where the likelihood is that loan would not be made in the future because it would not be purchased at a rate that could allow the borrower to afford it. Well, Mr. Bernanke, well, everybody is for transparency, uh, but Chairman Bernanke testified uh, before several committees that uh, transparency is not enough that some of the, the uh, 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 lending uh, vehicles and some of the loans, some of the uh, financial products are so complicated that people don't understand them. And uh, I even uh, had before us in one, one hearing, we had the head of Freddie Mac say that he read his credit card disclosure statement, the fine print, uh, for hours with his wife over dinner, and they couldn't figure out what it meant. Uh, so. Uh, one way to make sure that the lender is a little more careful is if he has a little bit of the skin in the game, I would think. You know, how is it better that you have no skin in the game and all you are doing is getting a fee and moving it off uh, the next day so you have absolutely no, you, you have no skin in the game? You'll be, it appears to me you would be more careful if you, if you had a risk retention, which has been the traditional way of banking. That is the old way of going to your community bank and uh, getting a loan, and bankers were very careful on in what they did because uh, uh, they were responsible for that loan. But the way it became is that no one had any skin in the game. You collected your fee and went to Florida. Um, and we, got, uh, we lost $15.5 trillion in household wealth. Uh, we almost went into, uh, we almost went off the cliff. And, uh, and uh, most economists say that uh, the fact that there was no skin in the game, no risk retention contributed greatly to it. So uh, give me your thinking again on that. Yeah, I'd so, like to understand. So, uh, first of all, in the summer of 2001, I wrote a, a, a lengthy paper called A Home Without Equity is Just a Rental with Debt, warning that with the changes that we had seen structurally, which were being unrecognized, we would end up in exactly the place we did. The end of 2004, 05, 06, I spent time with people at the Fed, with people at Treasury, with people at various regulators, warning that we had passed the peak and we were in for it. In February of 07, I put out a paper on the credit crisis that was about to happen in the CDO MBS market and how it would impact the real economy. If you are asking me to defend the Fed's understanding of what was about to happen or their look now at what happened, uh, I won't do so. I will continue to say that if investors had the ability to properly price loans, the loans would be prohibitively expensive where the risks are too high for borrowers to take them. And that is a major part of the solution. It is the one that is the most could, honest answer. My time answer. is running out. I just want to get one more question. In arguing against risk retention, uh, you stated in your testimony, and I quote, to force investment banks uh, to increase concentrations of Health securities will only increase their risks. And that appears to be exactly the point. It will increase their risks. Uh, their incentive to focus on better underwriting, better quality of securities, and better outcome in the market. So if you increase their risk, wouldn't they be more careful? Only if they are capable of assessing their risk. As we demonstrated in this crisis, most of them had neither the operational nor modeling prowess to properly assess risk. You mean investment bankers could not assess the risk? That is exactly right. Uh, that, that I find hard to believe. Uh, I mean, uh, I think they understand risk more than most people. Well, most of them aren't in business today because they didn't understand the risk. Well, also, they didn't have uh, skin in the game. 
No, they could they, just gamble. Merrill, Merrill Lynch and Bear Stearns did have skin in the game. Lehman Brothers did have skin in the game. Those who were able to rush to the exits and get their skin in the game out of the House in the few months prior to the full unfolding of the crisis didn't have skin in the game. But they, too, prior to that, did have skin in the game, many of them, and would have met the same fate as those that are no longer with us. And so you say the answer is more transparency. I say the answer is allow investors to risk price because, again, the investors' interests are actually aligned with the borrower's interest. Even now, as we are in crisis, the investor understands that a 20 percent principal write-down in many cases may well make a lot more sense than a 70 percent loss given default, and it is oftentimes the investment bank or the servicer affiliated that doesn't want that to happen. So the borrower and the investor's interests are tied at the their, their, their interests are tied together because one has an interest in getting paid and the other has an interest in paying. And so you need to make sure that they have the information to properly assess and price the risk. Well, I Thank would you. say give them Would the information, like but give them, give them risk retention, too. I think that would be safer. But anyway, my time is up. I thank the gentlelady uh, who is uh, also a member of the Financial Services Committee. So uh, thank you for your input and your questions. I recognize the full committee chairman, uh, Mr. Issa of California, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I won't take five minutes, and I, I appreciate being recognized well, here. I would be happy if you yield me the, yielded me the balance of your time. I, I would appreciate that. And I shall, Mr. <laughs> chairman. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and having just come in, I, I, uh, this may have been asked, but I appreciate the, uh, the concept of somebody retaining skin in the game. But let me just ask a rhetorical question for a moment. Hopefully it won't take the Chairman's time. Your, your certified public accountants don't retain skin in the game, even though they do an audit. They get paid. They provide a service. In a sense, although we understand some of the things that went wrong in some cases where people were packaging up and selling products, aren't there times in which what you really need is full disclosure, but ultimately when you buy a car, the car dealer doesn't necessarily keep any skin in the game, but if he sells you a bad car, you go back to him. So as much as I appreciate the, the nature of the rule, don't we also have to have out clauses if certain other things are met, Mr. Rosner? Yeah, in my, that, that's why in my testimony uh, I feel very strongly that before a deal comes to market, investors should have a right to inspect the loan level data. And there needs to be standardized pooling and servicing agreements. There need to be standardized representation and warranty agreements um, that really do define on a collateral standardized basis what the rights and obligations of various parties are. This is one of the things that Fannie and Freddie did do well. Now, yes, they retained the risk. Nonetheless, investors in their instruments fully understood that deal to deal, they were actually contractually identical. We have a situation where you had as many as 300 different pooling and servicing agreements, each with different rep and warrants attached to it leading to the crisis. And when people started seeing early payment defaults rise and jitteriness in the markets, people said, you know what, I'm going to get rid of these positions because I don't have time to read 300 300-page 300 documents, and I'll come sift through the rubble on the other side. And unfortunately, that led the stampede from which we are all suffering, and the housing finance system came to a grinding halt as a result. I appreciate it. And as promised, I yield the balance to the Chairman. I thank the Chairman for, for yielding. And, um, uh, Mr. DeMarco, in, in terms of, of some of the steps you have taken in FHFA in terms of disclosures, um, there is a uniform mortgage data program. There have been some significant delays with that. But I, I do want to say thank you, because this is significant steps for disclosures. But I also realize there have been uh, some, some limitations with this as well. Well, um, I mean, when we, when we announced it last May, we said it was a, a two-year project, and uh, we are continuing to push ahead. And, in fact, there are some positive steps and, and results that have uh, arisen from this. But it is, it is, it does take time, sir, and we are continuing to do it. And I do think it is an ingredient to the sort of things that you and the panelists have been talking about to have enhanced disclosure. You know, 
that assumes some things about the data that are being disclosed. Are the data consistently defined? Are they being reported in a consistent manner, regardless of who the loan originator is or who the appraiser is? And so what this uniform data program is, is it is actually sort of the foundation for this transparency. We are trying to get within the marketplace a uniform set of definitions and means of reporting data so that regardless of who the originator is and who the securitizer is, there is that kind of standardization in the market which should be able to, uh, to, to make the transparency that we are all advocating actually work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosner, so in terms of transparency, what are the unintended consequences of transparency? None. Okay. What are the unintended consequences uh, I should of, I should correct of that. 5 percent risk retention? I should correct the unintended consequences of, uh, of uh, transparency are that there is um, a thinner economic opportunity or a thicken, thinner margin for the issuers. And so they will have less of an arbitrage. It will negatively impact to some degree uh, their income. But the benefits will be passed on both to borrower and investor by the narrowing of that spread. As opposed to a 5 percent risk retention, which raises the cost of credit for consumers. There, thereby, if, if credit costs more, those that are extending it make more. Right? And I think to, uh, to, to Dr. Sanders' point, uh, the other risk of risk retention besides the correlation and the increased cost is that it may lead uh, to, a, to an increased uh, false sense of comfort that the work was done again by the issuer and therefore the investor doesn't have to focus on it as much. So rather than fixing this systemic risk problem, Dr. Sanders, in your testimony you say it actually creates more systemic risk. Uh, uh, that is correct, because the, uh, the risk retention rules, as written, uh, simply, just as Josh said, uh, Mr. Rosner, sorry, uh, said that we, we have all sorts of problems that creates, um, you know, false sense of security, it leads us down the wrong road, um, and those are, those are big issues. But when we get back to the whole nature of what, what risk retention doesn't do, as I said, it, that Wall Street can hedge away that risk already. So it's, it's not really a, or sometimes badly, and they may get caught stuck with the risk. But it, it can increase the systemic risk of the institutions and themselves. But I, can I add one more thing? If we're talking about trying to get loans to lower income households or more credit impaired households, I view risk retention and the QRMs as, as actually cutting people out of the market that want to get back in with, with somewhat impaired credit, et cetera. I don't think this is very good for consumers that have gotten, I think, 40 percent have had serious credit score degradation. That's not, this isn't going to help. This is going to make it worse. With full disclosure of information and no risk retention, then we are aware exactly what subprime loans are, then I think that is the great, the private sector can move forward with that, and that is the good solution. Have you looked at, uh, for instance, uh, auto financing or subprime auto financing securitization? Yes. Uh, did, that, did that world fall off and look like the housing securitization? Housing was something completely different because the automobile industry didn't have all the price of cars fall 60 percent at once together, not in all areas. But no, housing was unusual because it fell off a cliff, and that is why risk retention wouldn't, wouldn't help that. And, but again, reps and warranty. But how are, they, how are they able to actually have subprime securitization for autos, for instance, um, you know, and, and people are buying this, people are purchasing it, sophisticated investors are purchasing these things? Uh, Mr. Ross? Yeah, first of all, you have to remember the, the difference in the duration of the asset. You are talking about a 30-year mortgage versus typically a 60-month auto So that is the only difference? That is a major difference. The, the, the auto industry also, uh, the non-captive lenders really did learn their lesson in the late 90s. They went through a crisis very similar. Obviously, it had less broad economic impact to what the mortgage originators did uh, recently. Uh, both actually blew up. The original subprime mortgage industry and subprime auto finance industry both blew up in the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. Um, and the auto industry ended up sort of reconsolidated mostly by the captives. And so there was much more by way of control. But again, the duration, I think, is the biggest difference. Okay. Interesting. With that, uh, Ms. Spears recognized for five minutes. 
I have um, a somewhat facetious question to ask you. No, I think all of you. Have you just missed out in the last three or four years altogether? I spent three years on the Financial Services Committee, thousands of hours, literally, hearing testimony over and over and over again. And everyone said the same thing on both sides of the aisle. If you don't have any skin in the game, it is real easy to play the market. And it just seems like it is common sense. Now, you, Mr. Dr. Sanders, suggest that if there is full disclosure, you really don't need risk retention. Full disclosure to whom? Not quite. I am saying you need risk re uh, full disclosure, plus you need to tighten up the um, representations and warranties to protect the underwriting. So it wasn't, it wasn't. And again, reps and but, but, warranties well, already give you, skin in the game. That is what I am puzzled about. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure to whom? Full disclosure to investors. To investors. All right. Do you think that the investors that invest, invested in Goldman Sachs in their Abacus deal, I think it was Abacus, um, in which they were, for another client, shorting the same product that they were promoting on in the market. Do you think that was full disclosure? Uh, no, I don't think it was full disclosure. But then again, it comes back to what investors would invest in Abacus when they couldn't see what was inside of it. That's always puzzled me. Now, full disclosure oftentimes to, to the public and certainly to government is full disclosure to the regulators so they can, in fact, oversee what is going on. And I am reminded that when AIG was profiting handsomely from CDOs through their financial products division in London and had stretched themselves to um, immeasurable um, places, I asked the question, did the Office of Thrift Supervision know what a CDO was? And they answered no. So I think that it is very simplistic, frankly, to suggest that somehow full disclosure is the panacea. And the American people aren't stupid. And the American people get it. If you don't have skin in the game, if the banks don't have to retain some form of risk, then why wouldn't you sell garbage over and over and over again? Because you have no skin in the game. You have nothing to lose. If you and I were to flip a coin and it was tails you win and heads I lose, why would I play with you? But that is what you are somewhat suggesting. I apologize for not really answering, asking a, a question, but let me just respond to and ask your comments. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Mm -hmm. Many hearings, reviewed many documents, and in part of their report they said, on Wall Street, where many of these loans were packaged into securities and sold to investors around the globe, a new term was coined, IBGYBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. It referred to deals that brought in big fees up front while risking much larger losses in the future, and for the long and for a long time, IBG, YBG worked at every level. I guess I would just like you to comment on that. Mr. Rosner? Yeah. So, first of all, there are, there are typically four risks that regulators consider, right? Operational risk, liquidity risk, um, um, uh, credit risk, and reputational risk. And all of the firms that really abused the reputational risk in exactly the way you are talking about, are the ones that really did go out of business. Do you think Goldman Sachs had a reputational well, risk? Well, hold on. No. Now you are going back to the other, now you're going to the other question on the Abacus deal, and, and that actually, the transparency, the collateral would have actually been helpful, and transparency to the other side investor this seems to be a, a different issue, and that may be a securities issue. It seems that the SEC felt it was potentially and, and, and addressed it as such. Uh, but even there, I would point out that we get back to the same issue, which is if investors had the 
information available that, to them to do the full analysis, they would have and might not have participated in that deal. We are talking about qualified institutional buyers. These are sophisticated investors. And I will add one last piece, which is regarding uh, uh, whether the regulator did know what was going on with AIG. Uh, I would point out that, as I pointed out in the General Lay's time has expired. I will give the gentleman the opportunity to finish the, the question in a late and, 2000, uh, the panel to comment. In a late 2000 and early 2007 paper I wrote, I highlighted the fact that none of the Federal financial regulators had access to the CDO deal data because none of them were qualified institutional buyers. The first was the FDIC, and that didn't happen until 2007. That is a problem with transparency. Mr. Chairman, yes, I realize my time has expired, but I am just curious, and if you think it is appropriate to ask the question, maybe you will ask it. I am wondering if any of the panelists feel it, that we have to Well, you are asking it, so go ahead and ask. It is fine. Well, it's just, just the two of us here. Well, we, can, we can work this out. Good. I am curious if you believe that there are institutions now that are too big to fail in this country, and what is the remedy? We will ask the whole panel. I would be interested in everyone's comment as well. Good question. Absolutely. No question. It is one of the things that, as a financial service industry analyst, bothers me the most. I would have loved to have seen Dodd-Frank include a simple paragraph that said, any institution that requires extraordinary government asset purchase, debt guarantees, or more than 60 days at the Fed window would be operating under immediate supervisory action, and their executives and board would be prohibited from employment in the financial service industry for a period of five years in any capacity. I think that would have forced them to decide either to shrink themselves to a point where they were manageable or increase their expenditures on risk management to make sure that they dealt with their risks. But we have chosen to pretend that they are not, to keep them afloat, and in fact to codify their too-big-to-fail to advantages in many parts of Dodd-Frank. Dr. Sanders? Well, yeah, of, of course there are too big to fail firms. But one thing I want to point out is that the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman Bernanke, and, and the Federal Reserve System already had the regulations in place to prevent too big to fail. And they just chose not to follow their own regulatory guidelines. Mr. Radcliffe, if you would like to comment as well. I think to some extent it is not just institutions but systems that sometimes we just can't afford to let fail. And I think the important thing is to recognize those and, and proceed accordingly rather than pretending that there isn't a situation where government is going to have to step in, keep sure. systems afloat. Mr. DeMarco, I don't know if you want to jump into that one. Not that you have got enough balls in the air. Um, I don't believe any firm should be considered too big to fail. And I believe that under Dodd-Frank, the regulators have been given a um, uh, tremendous uh, challenge and set of responsibilities to ensure that we operate uh, the oversight of a financial system in the future so that institutions are not too big to fail. And it will remain to be seen what we are doing now to implement our Dodd-Frank responsibilities. Um, to see how this to see how this works, but I do not believe that institutions should be considered too big to fail, and I believe Congress has challenged the regulatory community uh, with that uh, with that right. objective. Uh, Mr. Marker, I have two final questions for you, if if I may. Um, you know, if 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 many players get out of the mortgage securitization business because of this risk retention, uh, holding this capital. Um, how does that play out? Does that make it better for the consumer or worse? Well, currently, um, virtually all mortgages being originated, uh, certainly well over 90 percent, are being securitized through uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Ginnie Mae. So uh, implementation of the risk retention rule, even as proposed, um, you know, in the near term, until we reach a resolution of the conservatorships with Fannie and Freddie, uh, will have limited, um, limited impact. Um, so I think that that, combined with the fact, you know, we put out a proposed rule here and asked over 170 questions. So the regulators are looking for a lot of input from the marketplace, from the whole array of, of stakeholders in this and people that have a view. Panelists here have expressed views. I expect we will be getting comments like that, comments coming from different angles. And I believe that the group of regulators charged with implementing this, you know, fully intend 
Uh, we were expecting a considerable volume of comments, and we intend to, to take, our, uh, take a, a very careful review of that. It is not that common to ask 170-some questions in a proposed rulemaking. The regulatory community is looking for input so that that can better inform what we do in terms of the final rule. So how does this risk retention rule add value? So the intention that uh, that Congress had in doing this, I think, has been pretty well, um, you know, debated each side here. But 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 it is intended to add value by making an explicit statement uh, and and creating an explicit particular structure so that issuers of asset-backed securities retain credit risk here, so that they will better discipline and pay greater attention to the underwriting that is done at the time of loan origination to enhance the quality of the loans that are then pooled and sold to investors in asset-backed securities. That is the, that's the theory we are operating behind here, and that is the, uh, you know, the intended outcome. It does certainly you know, seem to better align the incentives. There are some legitimate concerns that panelists here and others have raised, and the, uh, the regulators are going to take a look at that to see you know, whether you know, the, the proposal ought to be changed in any way. But we are operating with a given statute that says several things. It says that the risk retention is focused on the securitizers. It says, I would like to correct one thing that was said earlier, the, secure, the, the securitizer with their retained risk is under the law not allowed to hedge that risk. Um, and uh, you know we are going to get a lot of comments to see uh, what, sure. the, uh, what the so market participants view as the potential implications. So that is, to Mr. Sanders' point, the systemic risk element added here. If you can't hedge that risk, which, I mean, is financial institutions, do they seek to hedge as much of their risk as they can? Uh, is that, uh, I mean, I am asking this rhetorically. Of course you do. Uh, if, if I have an asset, I want insurance on it. I mean, I think most, most people do that. D Dr. Sims, I, I do want to ask you this, because in the previous securitization market, let's just go back a couple of years, you have, in order to sell a securitized pro uh, 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 product on the market, you have to first sell really the mezzanine, right, before you can really sell uh, that is sort of the first piece you got to sell. So many firms would retain that in order for them to sell off. Basically, yeah. that first loss position they, they retain. Yeah, it has been industry practice in any deal I have ever seen. They usually retain at least 5 percent and sometimes up to 20 percent of the deal in the, in the private label market. We are not talking about agencies. So that has always been the case. Okay. So what would be the problem of saying, you know, th this is a bank regulation, for instance, going back. You know, you realize that banks are holding more capital on the books, so you raise the regulatory uh, amount that they have to hold on their books. And what do banks do? They then raise the amount of capital they ho hold beyond that because they don't want to approach that regulatory, mm -hmm. you know, that regulatory uh, mandate, right? W why not just simply recognize what the market's doing and saying that's great and this rule doesn't have a major impact. Well, I think what would you say to folks that would say that? I would say the, the private sector has already, had already been doing that as industry practice, and the whole housing price crash wiped out even their first loss pieces, as we know. Those got torched very early on. So it is not even effective, but what my concern with, with now is going through and stating a 5 percent regulatory uh, target is that we will see suddenly everyone maybe even shrink from 20 percent risk retention and go down to 5 percent. So this could actually make uh, institutions more risky. They will hold less. Ms. Radcliffe, do you agree? Disagree? What are your I, comments I, on? I disagree. I mean, there is going to have to be capital to support the risk somewhere in the system. Um, Where does that come from? Well, it can come from a number of sources, but it has got to be out there and it has got to be a level playing field. And for nobody to take any risk on the loans is not going to help us. I think we did see a lot of people try to hedge their risk and think they laid it off on somebody else who thought they knew what they were doing and they thought they had enough uh, transparency and they thought they had good enough models and they were wrong. So basically your answer is simply we need Fannie and Freddie back because that makes it all work. That seems, that seems interesting to me. Dr. Sanders, will you re no, respond to that? Yes, sir. 
No, actually, we were going through, Mr. DeMarco made an excellent point. We have to get private capital back into the mortgage market. And I think uh, Freddie, Fannie, and the FHA, bless their hearts, uh, unfortunately, with their guarantee, are keeping rates so low, I mean, it's, you know, basis points over Treasury rates, that if we want to attract capital back, we actually have to kind of have more private sector participation without the guarantee that will boost yields and attract investors back. So I, I really want to go with what the administration said earlier, is start paring them down, if not um, <clears throat> dismantle them. Mr. Rosner? I, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, th there is a truth that doesn't want to seem to be heard uh, on Capitol Hill, which is mortgage rates have to rise. And no one in Washington wants to accept that as the necessity or as the reality required for private capital to come back. That is what is going to have to happen one way or another to revive a private label market or even have a properly risk-priced government-supported market. I would also point out, though, that there were, and I agree with Ms. Ratcliffe, in terms of capital is a big piece of the answer. Um, and I would also remind you that a lot of the problems that we saw, uh, sort of secondary and, and side effect problems that we saw, were arbitrages on the difference between regulatory capital requirements of various parties. If you remember, the, 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 the insurance regulators had much lower capital level requirements than the Federal regulators, and that became an opportunity to arbitrage or theoretically transfer risk to insurers who weren't capitalized enough to hold those risks. All right. Ms. Radcliffe, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to, to follow up on, on or respond to that, if you would like. And then I realize Mr. DeMarco has, a, has had to leave, and so we have got one final question for the whole panel, but I, I do want to give you an opportunity to comment. Yeah, I, I want to just say that the, I think that the, the, the transparency and risk retention accomplish sort of complementary but different things, and that the other thing that together that they can help do is just reduce the overall amount of risk that the system takes on. These are really their natural market mechanisms that ought to dampen the willingness of all parties along the spectrum to take on risks, and so they wouldn't necessarily take on the same magnitude of risks they took on back in 2004 to 2006. So in that case, I would argue strongly that the net effect of both of those would be overall reduction in systemic risk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, obviously, there is some disagreement on that from the panel. But I, my final question, we will start with you, Ms. Radcliffe, and we will go right down the line. And final question, I promise. Um, do you think that the most powerful tool to address this challenge, to address this problem, the most powerful tool, market-based tool, would be transparency? And the challenge is, sir? Well, the challenge is, I, I don't know if you have been, you know, uh, this, this question of securitization, private sector, it, okay, let me give you context, okay? In light of Fannie and Freddie and the government being 90 percent of the mortgage market, with Mr. DeMarco having you know, the, the largest housing portfolio in the world under his control. And I would say, you know, we, we realize you do not seek such. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is not part of ambition, we understand. We, we realize you have got one of the most challenging jobs in Washington. But in light of that, what is the most, you know, is, is transparency the most powerful tool to make sure that we can have a private sector market for mortgages? I think it's yes uh, or no. I mean, if you think no, it's fine, and we can um, keep rolling here. I'll say that I think there are some better tools, such as capital level, regulatory capital level, regulatory so capital playing field. Five percent is good. Um, that's not adequate necessarily for systemic 10? capital. It depends on the types of risk the system takes on. Twenty. That, that would depend entirely on the risk profile of the loans that are made. I would suggest that that would represent a fairly high risk market that we wouldn't want to return to that level of inherent risk. Hmm. Mr. Rosner, if you're talking about to solve the problems of the securitization market yes. itself and the risk transfer. Uh, yeah, transparency um, in a standardized, manageable format with corresponding standardization of contract and representation and warranties, I think, are the best solution. 
Can that be done in the private sector? It absolutely can be. Unfortunately, uh, I think that that task has been led not with investors' interests at core, but with issuers' interests at core. And so I think that we need to see that paradigm changed or regulators need to get more involved to foster an environment where that is being created on behalf of the investor community. Dr. Sanders? I would say transparency absolutely is the most important one. And again, I'm just going to say one last time. I think for those households that have credit impairment after the housing bubble crash, I think risk retention rules are going to work in the exact opposite direction. It will cut off credit to households that really want it. And that really scares me. Dr. DeMarco. Um, Mr. DeMarco. Uh, to have private at-risk capital invest in an asset-backed security, uh, undertaking that credit risk, having transparency is essential. But if I may go further, I mean, it, it is essential that there be full and appropriate and high-quality data there. Uh, to some of Mr. Rosner's points, there does need to be attention to standardization, to terms of contracts. There may be a role for government in doing that, because the government can take a look at all the stakeholders, not just one party, but one might argue as well that that, that would be executed by, by private, private groups doing it. Um, but I do think that transparency and having real, it's not just being transparent, but what is it we're being transparent about? There's got to be the right data properly and timely disclosed uh, and understandable to the investors. That's the full definition of transparency that would be essential for private risk capital to, uh, to really return to uh, investing in mortgage-backed securities where they're undertaking the actual mortgage credit risk. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate your time. And I'm sorry. Yes, I recognize the uh, ranking member. Patiently waiting. And I, I would say to the gentleman that, that Mr. DeMarco's time, he's, we've pushed him beyond his time. So if you start with him and let him go, he'd probably appreciate it. Uh, sure, I, I, I certainly but I do recognize that. the ranking member. I, I, I just, I'm just, um, I want to understand, Mr. DeMarco, when you say transparency, and then I hear Rosner, Mr. Rosner say, some people that I would expect to understand the stuff that is transparent don't understand it. I am confused. And you just said a moment ago that there were, I think you said the investment bankers. I don't know. I can't remember who you said. The question was asked, who would understand? In other words, if that information was available, would folks understand it? And I think you can correct me if I am wrong. I could have swore you said, there are certain people that would not. No? Okay. So if we had transparency, let me go to you, Ms. Radcliffe, and then I will come back to you, Mr. DeMarco. The transparency, who would benefit from that, uh, Ms. Radcliffe? We have talked about a lot about transparency to investors, right. um, but I have also, in my comments, addressed the importance of transparency to borrowers. I think you need to have both, mm -hmm. and so transparency be, should be to the benefit of both ends of it. I still uh, believe that accountability is um, critically important to the equation, and transparency without accountability may not get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the, when I talk to my community banks, they have skin in the game. And the community banks in my district that I talked to said that this, their problem was not mortgages. I mean, the, the problem was mortgages from the standpoint that maybe people couldn't pay them back. But their problem was other things, like people losing their jobs and unable to make, you know, the car payments and all that kind of stuff. So is that, is that, does that, I mean, when, when, when a lot of people think about skin in the game, they think about their community banks, and the community banks had an interest. They serviced their loans. They made sure that they didn't give uh, no doc loans. And they knew that they would be out of business if they gave enough loans that were toxic. So, you know, to the layperson, it seems like it would make sense for somebody to be, you know, have to have some 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 risk here. And then they, and then Mr. Sanders, you were talking about people who 
want to come back into the game, well, a lot of people I'm talking about won't be in a position to get back into the game, period, maybe even in a lifetime. So I'm trying to figure out, and then I think about the fact of all these people who have lost so much. And I still don't think that a lot of folks get how significant this foreclosure problem is. I, I, I just, I, sometimes I wonder whether there's a disconnect with the people out there who, who are losing their houses, and basically that's what, that's all they had. So, so I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out why don't we err on the side of making sure, again, again going back to the community bank thing, making sure that people have, I mean, that these, these folks have some kind of incentive to do the right thing and due diligence and all that kind of stuff and have layers of, um, layers of protection, layers of uh, different sets of eyes. You follow me? Am, am I missing something? I mean, I'll start with you, that Mr. DeMarco, since you got to know. You look like you're straining to understand what I'm trying to say. No, sir. I, I, I okay, good. believe I understand what you say, and um, I, I would um, echo several things. Uh, I think that there has been a real damage to thousands of families across this country as a result of um, many uh, difficulties and problems in the way our finance system was working earlier this decade. And I think the toll on American families and on their communities, on their neighbors and so forth, is, is really been stunning. And there are some communities that are going to take many years to recover from this. And I think that's something we all should, you know, be very concerned about. And um, certainly for our agency, we're doing our best with, with, with foreclosure alternatives to try to help as many people stay in their homes as they can. Second, with respect to community banks, if I can make a larger point that I think may you know, resonate with some of the concerns you're raising. When I look at the mortgage market today and the way it's structured, I see tremendous concentration. I see concentration in mortgage origination. I see tremendous concentration in mortgage servicing. And it does make me wonder, where is, you know, as we contemplate changes to the country's housing finance system, that we go about that in a way in which the role of the community bank, the community lender, is not shut out. And in fact, we think about ways to better foster the involvement of community lenders in not just making loans, but continuing to service loans in their community. They have got the direct touch with the borrower, and they are in a good position to be able to understand the borrower's needs and help them before they get into trouble. And so I think about you know some of the things we have done sometimes meaning to be prudential uh, in, 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 in our actions has led to um, a concentration that is actually causing, you know, or could be said to be causing harm in our communities. And I think as we go forward and think about housing finance reform, what is going to be the role of government in housing finance, what does the post Fannie Freddie world look like? I think we should be very mindful of the role of community lending institutions and that we don't, in an effort to tighten things down everywhere, create an environment in which community institutions cannot participate and be um, robust and constructive participants, whether it is in housing finance or other parts of consumer finance. I hope that that is responsible. Yes, it is very helpful. So they, they have they're the ultimate skin in the game, folks, right? Am I right, Ms. Ms. Radcliffe? One of the Mr. Marco, I'm, I, I don't want to hold you up, and I, I, my time has run out anyway. But uh, well, I would say to the ranking member, if, if, if we could dismiss, uh, yeah, dis of dismiss Mr. Demarco. I want to thank you for your service to your government. Uh, I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you for dealing with uh, the schedule as well, and we apologize for that. But sure. thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Cummings. I appreciate being excused. At thank this you. Point, but I, I, my staff and I are fully prepared to follow up in whatever way would be helpful to the uh, to the subcommittee. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, uh, I'll yeah, you begin to answer my question, Ms. Rackle. Yes, uh, certainly to the extent that if community banks 
are willing to take the 5 percent risk or hold the loans on portfolio and take 100 percent of the risk, they are the ultimate skin in the game. And I think this speaks to one of the points we haven't addressed much here today is the um, alignment on the servicer side that there is also provisions for in the risk retention rules that there is evidence that lenders uh, who are servicing their own loans in their own portfolio tend to be more likely to pursue remedies that keep the borrowers in their home and minimize losses all around than those who are servicing for others. So that is another one of the alignment of interest problems that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, risk retention could seek to address that really full information doesn't get at. Just one last question. Going back to what you just said, Five percent seems like a little bit compared to um, what a community bank would be dealing with, and so I'm just wondering: is if if, I mean, if you're going to have a retention, is, do you think five percent is sufficient? In other words, to do the things that you just said, what you just said about them, you know servicing and they make sure, try to make keep the ball in the house and all that kind of stuff. Um, it seems like the bigger the bank, the less, it seems like they, they are much further away. And I just base this on what I see in my, in my community. They are much further away from the borrower. And so you don't have those relationships. So I am just saying, but 5 percent, I wonder if that even does it. You follow me? I you know, of course, it's hard to know, but I believe that relatively modest amounts of risk retention are effective, especially when structured right. And the regs have a number of different alternatives for looking at the structure. Are enough to get begin to get at some of the principal agent problems. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to be enough to protect the entire financial right. system, and that and that's sort of a different objective: is having enough capital system wide to you know pay for the losses than than just the behavioral aspects of a risk retention model. I would also add that um, small institutions can participate in the mortgage market by uh, holding loans in portfolio, potentially provided, we will see how the regs come out, maybe by carrying the, keeping some of the risks and securities. They can also participate um, by selling loans to Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And, and th those agencies right now, and, and hopefully some kind of successor function, would allow smaller institutions con to continue to offer the same kinds of products in communities around the country that the large banks can offer competitively. Uh, Ms. Ms. Raza, you had something? Uh, yeah. The, the community bank, I think, is a, uh, has been a very different type of player. And, yes, they do retain the risk. Uh, not only do they know their customer they know the customer's company, usually. They know the local economics of the market in which they are lending. They have a lot more information with which to assess risk, and therefore, for many reasons, have much more comfort in holding that risk, or can. Mm -hmm. The large firms, when you have, as we saw, an increasing concentration of loans that are being made by a handful of players such that, as of now, Last quarter, 56 percent of originations were done by three players. Okay? If you think that a lender in California knows anything of substance about, right. about a borrower in New York or any other community, he really doesn't. It is just a number. And when you have got firms that are inherently too big to fail, they know that even if they are forced to retain 5 percent, it is not their 5 percent. It is the taxpayer's 5 percent. And so we haven't addressed that. And the risk retention, as I said before, I fear is almost a, a false sense of comfort, because as we saw in, even in the FCIC report, a lot of the senior most managers of many of the firms did not even understand or know and weren't apprised of the risks that their firms retained as it was, in many cases, risks that ultimately sunk those firms. And so I think, as, as Mr. DeMarco pointed out, we do have to figure out a way to get deconcentration of lending, deconcentration of servicing. And I am just not sure that in a world where we already have institutions that have extraordinary benefits and think of themselves as too big to fail, that giving them the right or almost the responsibility to hold more and more risk, holding the taxpayer more and more hostage, is the right answer. 
Mr. Chairman, you have been quite uh, lenient, but I have to say this. You know, I think the thing that, first of all, I want to thank all of you for testimony. It has been very helpful. I just hate the idea of Mr. Rosner kind of throwing up our hands and saying, you know, we can't, we cannot control this. I, that's what it seems like. I mean, and I just, I, I just, I, it just seems to me that in a nation that um, where we can uh, send somebody to the moon, it seems like we ought to be able to to straighten out this mess so that it doesn't happen again, and and so that and it, so that it makes sense, so that little people or regular just everyday people are not crushed. I mean, crushed. And as I say to my constituents, I, I think what I'm seeing right now probably is the greatest transfer of wealth in my lifetime, from 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 middle class to upper class. There is a tremendous transfer of wealth, and it's it's really kind of sad, and it and it's come in so many forms, and foreclosures is one. Anyway, thank you very much. And I appreciate the ranking member. And uh, if the members do want to make a comment uh, about the gentleman's statements, I'm happy to hear it. The, the, Mr. Chairman, I, I've just been interested in the questions and I, good feedback. And I think we've had a good panel. And um, it is a good question. I mean, it, it, is that what you're? Is that sort of the idea, Dr. Sanders, Mr. Rosner, sort of throwing up your hands, Ms. Ratcliffe, just throwing up your hands and just say we can't do it? Or what is that? What is that answer? So, uh, well, let me. T uh, yeah. I'll, I'll try this first. Um, I moved here from Phoenix, Arizona. So, about foreclosures, yeah, I'm painfully aware of how, what it does to the community and how, many, how households suffer when that happens. And I've seen community banks out there just go away. Uh, and that, that's bad because I'm a big supporter of community banks for all the reasons Mr. Rosner said, mm -hmm. which is very good. But again, I, I get back to the point that there really is something good we can do. It's strengthen representations and warranties, which is, by the way, is the ultimate skin in the game. It's not 5 percent. If, if, you know, because what happens is if a bank such as Wells Fargo or one of their subsidiaries misleads investors, investors then file, and there are tons of these suits lined up in court, and they will, in some cases, collect the money back. And again, I, to, to go back to uh, Mr. Cummings' question, we are saying, well, that is after the fact, they will collect money. Well, going forward, if you strengthen these and make it clear that we will enforce these laws, we will enforce these regulations that are on the book and have transparency, you will, we will see a lot different market going forward, but we really have to have those things. And I am not, not waving my hand. I want to move forward. I am just concerned that risk retention gets focused on and it doesn't achieve what we think it is going to do. Yeah, I mean, we have had, we've had uh, many, of the, many of the underlying problems that brought us to where we were um, were illegal activities, both on behalf of, at times of borrowers and at times of lenders. Um, it seems that they exist in the servicing world as well. We have seen no enforcement, which I find to be astonishing. Uh, I have spent most of my uh, since leaving the traditional sell side, I have spent my entire career uh, highlighting and warning of exactly the issues that we have come to live with um, and doing analysis on that. Uh, I am not at all throwing up my hands. What I am suggesting is that we have to avoid the, the false sense of solving something that we are not solving. And the closest we get is make sure that the information out there is so so clear, so standardized, um, and so uh, manageable that you can't hide reality from either borrower or from investor. Ms. Radcliffe? I agree with all that. I think that it is quite possible that if all we did was increase transparency for investors and let them run all these tapes and fields, records through their models, that too could potentially create a false sense of security. I mean, to your earlier point, I think the, the saddest thing about this situation is that it didn't really have to happen. You know, wh why didn't the market ask for the reps and warrants then? Why didn't the private investors get those? Why, why didn't they get more information then? Mr. Rosner saw it coming. It seems like private investors could have 
used what information they had. They had enough information to be able to anticipate some of these events. You the, did. They, they didn't really have the information, i.e., the, the, the information that we are talking about, the loan level information. And unfortunately, uh, I am not here to make excuses for the investor community, uh, but the reality is you have got a broad and, and, and very diffuse investor community, 10,000 or so firms, who to get them to even uh, offer comment letters on rulemaking processes or uh, accounting rules to which they are extremely exposed is almost impossible. And so you have got that relative to a handful of firms who are ultimately making the rules, and there has been no regulatory intervention on behalf of the investor, who, by the way, harms. You have got to remember that a lot of those people who have lost their houses have been doubly harmed because they have lost their pension assets, they have lost other investment assets. Right? They have they've been harmed all along the way. They are investors. Most investors, most professional investors are managing money for many of those same people. So I, I agree with everything Mr. Rosner said. I just wanted to say that we are not, uh, it, this is not rocket science. I think the, the mortgage finance system for a number of years really has worked fairly well for a lot of people, and we do know what it is going to take to get it right. These are, in a lot of ways, common sense things, and this either-or discussion is a little misleading. We need the transparency. We need the risk retention. We need the skin in the game. We need the capital. We need transparency in markets. We, need, we, we know what we need here. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate the ranking members' questions as well. I, I would just say, in closing, I, I, thank you for uh, uh, staying for an extended period of time. I certainly appreciate your candor in answering these questions. Um, it is a highly important issue. And let us make no mistake about it. There is skin in the game, as there always has been with securitization at all levels. The question is, what can we do to foster more transparency uh, in this marketplace? Clearly, Dodd-Frank doesn't address this. Uh, I think the takeaway from today is that um, more transparency could, would not be a harmful thing to my constituents who seek a mortgage. It wouldn't be a harmful thing to investors, because they would at least have greater certainty in the products they are purchasing. Uh, I think those are uh, some enormous takeaways that we can agree to um, in, in a wider array. And so I certainly appreciate uh, you addressing those issues, it, it certainly is an important issue, not, here, not simply here in Washington or in, on Wall Street, but, but for Main Street, for the average Americans um, and average homeowners, even those that are paying their mortgage. Um, but uh, we want to make sure we get this right, and that is what this hearing is about. And I certainly appreciate your information and informing us as pol public policymakers about that. Thank you, and the hearing stands adjourned.